Okay, so um, now we have uh, finished off the guest lectures, including my own guest lecture, I guess. Uh, so now it's time to go back to uh, the other part of the course. I mean, of course, the guest lectures uh, are there to support your choice of the third part of the project and also to introduce you to, it's an integral part of the course. So there will be questions about this on the exams and so forth. So, uh, it's, so um, it's really a part of the course, that's what I'm trying to say. But now we'll get back to where we uh, ended before for the guest lectures. And it has to do with retransmission protocols, ARQ protocols. We talked about the basic first protocol uh, last time um, called stop and wait. We also talked about uh, go back end to some degree. We will finish off go back end today and talk a little bit about selective repeat. And what uh, are the pros and cons with these different things? Okay. So a um, short review. Uh, so what we want to do is to provide a service which uh, um, pro uh, provides uh, transmission of packets or frames. Uh, reliable in the sense that uh, packets are delivered in order without errors uh, regardless if there are errors in the layer below us. So to keep track of everything here we will use uh, something called sliding windows to keep track of the transmit and receive packets. So sequence numbers here which enumerate the packets so there is an order of the packets or frames Okay, so I will use packet and frames interchangeably. It means the same thing. So there is a certain order of this. So it's the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, and so forth. So we can enumerate those. Now, for practical purposes, we want to reuse these uh, sequence numbers. So we assign, say, m bits to the sequence numbers, which means that the highest number we can uh, uh, have, if we start at zero, would be 2 to the power of m minus 1. Okay, so whenever we do arithmetic on sequence numbers here, it's implied that that is modulo 2 to the power of m. So for instance, if we have a 4-bit uh, sequence uh, numbers here, that means that the sequence numbers can be from 0, 1, up to uh, 2m minus 1, which is 15 in this case, right? So the sequence numbers here of the, of the packets could uh, range from 0 to 15, and when we go to 15, we recycle and start over with 0. Okay, and then we have a concept of what's called a window or a send window. And this has a size, 8 in this case, which is basically the focus of our attention at this current time. So at the current time, we keep track of 8 of these packets in this infinite sequence of packets. Okay, so these are the packets that we are concerned about at the moment. And how to interpret this is that uh, within the, the, the window, which starts here and ends here, so this is the window, um, we have some packets to the left here. And these are packets that we have already processed at the transmit side. We have received them from the layer above. We have sent them over the packet. We have received acknowledgments for them. Everything is fine. These have been delivered. Okay, so we don't care about those anymore. Then we have a bunch of packets that we care about at the moment. Some packets, 7, 8, and 9 here, are packets that we have transmitted, but have not yet received acknowledgments uh, for. So these are packets which uh, are transmitted, but not yet delivered. At least we don't know that at the transmit side. We aren't sure about the status of these. And then we have a number of empty slots here in the, in the send window. And these are slots for packets which we have not yet received from above. So in this current state here, we have three packets which we have received from the layer above and we have transmitted those. We have space for five more packets in our send window. We haven't received those yet. Then we have two state variables, one which is called SF and one which is called SN. And SF 
is the first, or F for first, I guess, is the first or the oldest outstanding packet. So what is an outstanding packet? Well, an outstanding packet is a packet that we have transmitted, but not yet have acknowledged, uh, received an acknowledgement for. Then we have a state variable called SN, and this points at the slot, an empty slot in the send window, which is the sequence number of the next packet that we will transmit. So we have transmitted packet 7, 8, 9, the next one we will transmit will be 10. Okay. Um, the size of the window is the number of available positions where we can put our packets in. And to the right of the send window, we have future packets, which we cannot accept from the upper layer here. So if the send window is full, that we have no empty space here, then the upper layer is blocked. Okay. It cannot uh, request transmission for any new packets. So the, the, the uh, okay, yeah. And then what happens when <coughs> SF is equal to SN? Then by convention, we mean that that means that there have been, there are no outstanding packets. So the send window is completely empty. We have no packets in transmission at, the, at that point in time. Okay. Um, so in go back in, our main idea is the following, is that the receiver is essentially as in stop and wait. So we, uh, we can think of that as having a receive window of size one. Uh, we use a send window, which has a size which is greater than one. And we use cumulative acts. Which mean, and I will explain what that means in the next slide. The many variations of this go back in. So when you read in Fursan, the, the textbook, you will get one explanation. If you read in another book, you potentially would get another explanation. And if you read on Google, you get the third one. So there is a little bit of, uh, of uh, there is not one single uh, protocol here. However, we will use the version which is described in our book uh, to avoid uh, too much confusion here. Uh, in Fursan, uh, go back n is de described as a uh, transport layer protocol. That is not uh, go back n is not constrained to be only in the in the app, uh, transport layer. It could be uh, also in the data link layer for sure, and then other layers also. So, but uh, if you read it, it will be in the chapter that deals with transport layer. So, but don't don't take that as that go back n is only in the transport layer. It could be in other layers also. Okay, um, now, so the send window for go back in, um, we use uh, acknowledgements uh, with uh, acknowledgement numbers. So when we get an acknowledgement back from the uh, receiving end, there is a sequence number or there is a number in that acknowledgement called the ACNO. So the ACNO is the acknowledgement number we get. And then the question is, how should we interpret this ACNO? Uh, we use cumulative acts here, which means that uh, an act with a uh, number ACNO acknowledge all packets which have sequence numbers which is less than ACNO. So I'll take that one more. If I get ACNO, say three, that means that it acknowledge all packets with sequence numbers less than three. So packet two, one, zero, and then go back to uh, whatever uh, we had earlier, maybe 15, 14, 13, and so forth. So the following happens, that if the transmitter gets an acknowledgement, it's error-free. If it's er erroneous, we just toss it. But if we get an error-free acknowledgement message with acknowledgement number ACNO arrives, then what do we do? First of all, we ignore the ACK if ACNO is outside the window. So if it's less or equal to SF or greater than SN, we ignore it. So if I get an ACNO, which is less than SF, what do we mean by that? That ACK will acknowledge all packets which are to the left of the window. Uh, and it, it doesn't mean anything from us because we have already received acknowledgements for this. So it brings no new information to us, okay? On the other hand, if the ACNO is greater than SN, what does that mean? Well, it means that it acknowledges uh, some, something weird here. It acknowledges, for instance, um, a, a packet which has not yet been transmitted. So something is, is wrong here, if that happened. And then in that case, we toss it also. If the ACNO is uh, greater 
greater than SF and smaller or equal to SN, then we process that. Okay, so here, if the ACNO is in this range, then we, we process that. Okay. So the thing is to keep track of here is that, you know, which of these acknowledgements actually means something to us. And the acknowledgements that are in this range actually means something to us. If it's to the right here, it's something which is completely bogus. If it's to left of us, it doesn't matter because we already knew that information. Okay, but anyways, if it is um, within this range, so if it's in the blue range here, uh, or let's do that purple instead. If it's in the purple range here, we need to do something about that. And what do we do? Well, we put SF, this variable, to act null. So uh, if, if this is the uh, ACNO we get, then what we do is that we move SF to the right and put it down here. So what does that mean? Well, it means basically that we move um, the left-hand side of the window to the right. So we slide the window. We, we move it to the right. then two things can happen. Either that SF is equal to SN, and that means that all the packets have been acknowledged and there are no uh, remaining outstanding packets. Or it could mean also that SF is less than SN, which means that there is still some packets in transition that we have not yet received acknowledgements for. There are outstanding packets. And this has a consequence. In the first case, we stop whatever timer we had because there is no more packets to time out. Uh, and if we receive, uh, if there's still some packets which are in, in, in transmission, then we restart the timer, which means that we put it, we reset the timer and start it again. Okay, so uh, we will talk more about the timer and what it means in this lecture. But are there any questions so far? So the transmitter logic is such that we acknowledge, uh, we process these acknowledgements as we go along, we slide the window if possible, we ignore bad acts. Okay. So uh, to give a, a small example of what's going on here, so suppose we have uh, three bit sequence numbers and we have a size seven window and then we transmit some packets. In the beginning state, SF is equal to SN, which means that there is no packets in transmission. Then we get a request from the layer above, and then we put in that packet uh, uh, as sequence number zero. Okay, so we store the packet here in the send window, and then we transmit packet zero over the, over the channel. Everything goes well, so that's accepted by the receiver. And then the receiver sends an acknowledgement and it sends an acknowledgement which acknowledged packet zero and all earlier packet. So what should be the uh, ACNO for that? What should be the number? What the number should be one, because that acknowledged all packets which are less than one, well, as a sequence number which is less than one, zero and so forth, right? Uh, and then this uh, ACNO uh, goes over that here, and this is then processed by the receiver. And the receiver says, okay, so it, oops, what happened? Um, okay, uh, so the, the, the receiver says, okay, I get an acknowledgement with ACNO1, which means that it acknowledges packet zero, this one. So it puts SF now equal to ACNO, that is puts SF equals to one, slide the window. Okay, and in this case, uh, we, there are no, outstanding packets anymore and we stop the timer because there is no need for a timeout now we don't have any packets in transmission okay and then we go on and then there is a new request from the layer above we get a new packet this is called packet number one it's transmitted over the channel it's delivered it's acknowledged and since there is packet number one the acknowledgement number is two the acknowledged packets one and zero and so forth this unfortunate, this acknowledgement is lost. 
uh, at the receiving end we get a new request and then we transmit packet number two so packet number two goes over the channel here it's uh, it's uh, received well so then uh, packet number two is acknowledged which means that the ACNO is three uh, the, uh, we get a new request from this and uh, uh, from the layer above we put in uh, packet number three here we transmit packet number three and uh, then at the receiving end what happens here at this point in time the receiver has transmitted packet one two three which are not yet acknowledged right so the receiver has no idea about the status of these packets but then receives an acknowledgement with acknowledgement number three at this point in time. That means that the receiver now knows that certain packets have been received correctly, namely packets who have sequence number less than three. Which are those? Well, it's packet number two and packet number one. So we can slide the window and just keep packet number three because packet number three has not yet been acknowledged. So we slide the window and then we're in this state. Okay. Uh, packet number three has already been transmitted and the acknowledgement for packet number three arrives here. And then we can slide the window and here we can also stop the timer because there is no more packets that needs to be timed out. Okay. Questions on this? Is the logic pretty clear to you guys now? Okay, so the idea is that we use cumulative acknowledgements, meaning that the ACNO that we get acknowledge not only one packet, but all packets which are, have a sequence number which is less than the ACNO. So this packet here, when it arrives here, acknowledge not only packet number two, but also packet number one. Packet number zero for that matter also, but that is of no consequence for us in this case. And the, the beauty of this is that we can lose acknowledgements without uh, disaster happening. Right? We have some uh, uh, robustness against lost acts with, with, this, with, with this idea. Okay, so now we have uh, looked at the case where we lose acts. Let's look at the case when we actually lose packets also. What, what, what is going to happen then? Um, when it comes to retransmissions here, then again, there are different versions of this. Uh, so if you read the literature, you might have other rules for doing retransmissions. But in the Fursan version of this, we use a single timer. And when the timer expires, we do retransmissions. So retransmissions are only triggered by timeouts, nothing else. Okay. So, uh, and when the timer expires, then we retransmit all outstanding packets. Okay. So if we're in a situation like this and the timer expires for some reason, we then transmit packet 7, 8, 9, 10. We retransmit all of these because we are uncertain about which of these packets have arrived or not. And the safe thing to do then is to retransmit all of them. So an example of this, it's a, a little bit it's small perhaps, but let's go through this. Uh, so here again, we start by having an empty send window. We get a request and then we fill in packet number zero. We transmit packet number zero, we get an acknowledgement, and then we slide the window. So here's a successful uh, sequence of, of transmissions and acknowledgement. Then we get a new, uh, 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 packet here, packet number one, we put that in the send window and we send it and we lose it. Okay, so here we lose the packet. Then say that we get a new packet, packet number two, we transmit packet number two. Packet number two arrives. Okay, so what is done here at the receiving end? The problem of the receiver here is that it only has space for one packet and it's uh, waiting for packet number one here. What did it get? Well, it got packet number two. That is of no use for the receiver. The receiver wants packet number one, not packet number two. You want packet number two only after receiving packet number one. It has no way to store packet number one, so it tosses that, it discards that, okay? 
So the packet is discarded. Of course, it cannot be delivered, right? Because the application, uh, the layer above it, should have packets in order. So that's not allowed. Has no way to store it. So what do you do? Well, you have to discard it. Okay. But then it sends back in an acknowledgement of what it wants. It sends back act one here because that's what it did previously. And by sending the act back one here is like insisting, okay, you send me something that I don't want. I want act. You can, we can also interpret this as I request packet number one uh, when you send back an act one here. That's another way to interpret that. Okay, but the, but the, receiver, is un, the receiver is still unaware of this. So it happily keeps on transmitting packets here, you know, packet number two and packet number three. Even when it gets packet number three, it, that is discarded. The packet is discarded because it's uh, it's out of order. We still want packet number one, right, at the receiver. We don't want packet number three. We don't want packet number two. So that's discarded. We transmit them back at here. And we keep on doing this. You know, it seems stupid, but we keep on doing this until the timer timeouts. There is a timeout here. So at the time of the timeout, the receiver says, uh oh, something must have gone wrong here. So what do we do then? Well, the time, the, the uh, transmitter looks in its send window and says, okay, I have packet one, two, three here, which some, there is something wrong here. So I'll just retransmit all of these. So packet number one, packet number two, and packet number three. And in this case, all of them happens to receive uh, perfectly. And they are acknowledged, and every, at the end of the day, we empty the send window. Okay. And then we're back to, to where we started. Okay. So the important thing here is that when we lose a frame, eventually this triggers a retransmission. And that retransmission is triggered by the timeout. At the time of the timeout, the transmitter transmits the outstanding packets, which is more packets, potentially, than those who have not arrived at the, at the receiver. But, but the, the transmitter knows that the receiver had to throw those away. So the receiver, sorry, the transmitter has to send them again. There is no other way. Questions? Yes. Uh, let's say we lose packet three. Mm. Uh, do we only retransmit packet two after packet one? We have X for the so, so if we lose packet number three here, yeah. um, in addition to packet number one, you mean or? No, no. Let's say packet one and packet two are. Gone. Yeah. So then, then uh, those would be then acknowledged. And and assuming that we don't lose the acknowledgments here then uh, we would slide the window so that packet number one and packet number two are, are released from the window. So when we get a timeout, it's only three that we retransmit. So the idea is that at timeout, you retransmit the outstanding packets, whoever, whatever they might be, right? That's a good question. Anything else? Okay, so um, uh, there is a state diagram of so this also. So if you if you have a hard time following the, the verbal or or step by step uh, explanation of this, you can look at these uh, state diagrams. There is sometimes also a little bit difficult to 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 read. So when I'm trying to understand the protocol, what I try to do then is to read the description of it. What is the main idea? And then I look at the at if there is a flow chart, I look at that. And if there is a state diagram, I look at that. And together, all of these three components or four components uh, gives me an understanding of what's going on. And then draw a couple of examples to figure out uh, what's going on. Right? So uh, I don't know what you think is the easiest way to do, but these are different equivalent descriptions of the same thing. So pick the one that you're more, most comfortable with. OK. Um, okay. Uh, so this is the receiver. So it's a little bit more compl 
compl uh, complicated than, than stop and wait. But anyway, so let's look a little bit about uh, these retransmissions because obviously what we would like to do is to uh, somehow um, be efficient. Um, so uh, if we then look at the, 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 the key things when designing this is to select the window size and a timeout. These are the two things that, that, that tells me basically that governs how many packets uh, are retransmitted retransmitted when there is a frame error. So, um, for Mac, if we start with the simplest case when there is no errors ever, right? So for maximum efficiency, when we have error-free transmission, what do we do? What should we do then? Well, we should select then the send window size to be uh, large enough to avoid idle medium. Okay. And the timeout should be larger than the round trip time to avoid unnecessary retransmissions. So, uh, if we draw a, a timing diagram of this, Oof. gross, how does it? I don't dare to use that one. transmitter here and a receiver time. So remember that when we start everything here, suppose we transmit the frame and it has a certain duration like this. Uh, and the duration of a frame is what we call TF. Okay. Then this is transmitted over the channel. There is some propagation delay. And then there's some processing delay, and then there's an acknowledgement going back like this, and there is some processing delay. And at this point in time, in stop and wait, we are ready to transmit the next packet. Okay. And the time between the initiation of the transfer to when the acknowledgement has been received and processed, this is called the reaction time or turnaround uh, round trip time. So this is a stop and wait, if you like, that we transmit one frame and wait until it has been acknowledged and then we're ready to transmit the next frame. If the, uh, the, the frame or the acknowledgement is lost, there is a timeout and then we transmit the next frame. Now, in go back end, we are not waiting for the acknowledgement of this packet until we transmit the next packet. So we can transmit the, the next packet here, say. And we can transmit, uh, we can continue with these uh, packets, say. Uh, like this. Okay. So at any given point in time, the maximum number of packets that we can have in the send window uh, determines how many packets we can, at the most, have in transmission at the same time. So, if everything goes well, the acknowledgement for this packet is arrived and, and, and uh, processed at this time, and then we can slide the window, meaning that we can forget about this packet and just keep the blue ones, right? So anyways, what I'm trying to say here is that the send window needs to be large enough so that we can continuously keep on transmitting packets. Because if it's too small, for instance, if it only holds three packets, then we can transmit this one, this one, and this one. But we cannot transmit this one, which means that we will be idle. We will not be using the channel to its maximum ability. Okay? So we want to keep the send window large enough. And if there are no errors, we need to have, in this case, one, two, three, four, five packets in the send window. So the send window size is determined by the turnaround time divided by the frame size. That, that is the minimum size of the send window we would like to use. Like this. 
it's error free now. So forget about errors. So this is uh, at least we want we want a window size this big. Now, if it's not an integer here, we round up. Okay, so this means uh, round up. This uh, these brackets. Okay. So in this case, we uh, t zero divided by tf is four point something, and then we round it up to five. Now, how about timeout? If we have error free, it doesn't matter what we choose to timeout to because there will be no retransmissions ever, right? But remember now, if, if, if we have errors, we would like the timeout to be uh, as small as possible, but not uh, smaller than this. So what do I mean by that? So if we timeout before T0, then we will force retransmissions regardless if these transmissions were correct or not. So it never makes sense to make the timeout less than the turnaround time. Okay. So the timeout, we want that to be larger or equal to T0, always, right? And so one choice for timeout in this case would be to set it to C, the size of the send window times T because this is a greater than T0. So we can select the timeout in this case to be this. Because then we give ourselves the, if we look at this packet, we give ourselves the time for this to be processed before it times out. Okay, and if it's processed correctly here, the window would slide. At this point in time, it would slide to forget about this, and then the timer when we slide will be reset. Okay, it will be reset actually starting from this time, and then there will be another time. So it's just the way. The So the timeout should be larger than the turnaround time, but we also want it to make relatively small. Uh, and, and the reason for this is that if we make the timeout very, very long, then if the first packet here is lost, it will be triggered a retransmission back way back here which means that we have a send window that, that spans the, the number of outstanding packets then is, is quite large. So we want to, the timeout to be also small. So this is a reasonable choice of these two things, the, the, the send window size and the timeout. There are other combinations one could also think about, but you know, to keep things simple, let's do this. It's not a completely stupid design. Any questions? In my experience, this is a little bit of a, the difficulty in, in Go Back Again to figure out okay, what is the relationship between the timeout, the send window, what should we do in different cases, and so forth. Right? So uh, if, you, if you're confused now, that's okay. If you're not confused now, maybe you should be. Because then, then, you, then um, maybe you should read up on this until you have a, a clear understanding of what's going on. Okay. Um, now, if there are errors here, for instance, if we lose this acknowledgement here, even though that this is okay, and if we lose this one, we would trigger a, a retransmission of all these frames uh, at this point in time when, the, when there is a timeout. So, if we want to be robust against errors in the acknowledgement, what we want to do then is to increase the, the size of the window with, with some number a. Like if a is equal to one, that means that we can tolerate one lost act. If a is equal to two, it means we can lose two consecutive acts without any problems. Uh, and then we then should uh, move the timeout also to, to, to uh, um, take this into account. Okay. 
So anyways, ha have a look at this, because I know it's a, it's a tricky thing to get your head around uh, the first time you see this. Uh, efficiency, okay? So uh, here, the efficiency will go back in here in the case, uh, okay, but let's wait with that actually. Let's just talk about efficiency in general. So what is this? Well, we have a AIQ protocol, it's in a certain layer. The idea is that we should provide a service. We should provide a service to the layer above us. We should provide error-free transmission of uh, service data units, which is uh, protocol data units in the layer above us. And it should be in, uh, delivered in, in uh, sequence without duplications. So the effective data rate of the service, what is that? Okay, so if I'm implementing an ARQ protocol, I'm providing a service to the layer above me. What is the quality of that service in terms of data rate? Well, the layer above it, what data rate does it, does it perceive? Well, it perceives the data rate uh, RF, the efficient, uh, effective rate. And that's basically the number of bits in one service data unit. So the payload I get from above, the number of bits of it, and divided by the time it takes to transmit that. So uh, that, that's the effective rate that the layer above us see. Uh, so if a layer uh, at uh, the layer below us have an effective rate of R, so that's the effective rate I can get from below me, then the efficiency of me, being the ARQ protocol, is the ratio between the rate that I provide and the rate that I got. Okay? The rate I get from below is greater than what I can uh, push up about. If I do nothing, basically the data rate below is what the data rate will be perceived to be above also. But as soon as I do a little bit of processing, it will be less than this. Okay, so maybe this will be clearer on the next slide. Um, so, um, it's not weird, it's unsynchronized. So let me do this, and then do this. Okay, here we are. Okay, so um, um, we're in this layer. So we're doing ARQ, which means that we transmit packets and we receive the acknowledgments. So this is what we have described now. Go back in or stop and wait or something like that. This is what we do. Um, the layer below us gives us R bits per second. Uh, the layer above us perceives a data rate which is uh, the effective rate. And the effective rate has to do with uh, the data rate of its logical channel here. Um, these service data units here consist of NF uh, minus N not bits. So what is NF? Well, NF is the number of bits in the transmitted frames. Out of those, N not bits is headers and stuff like this, which is of no particular use for the layer above us. It doesn't care about the headers. It only cares about its uh, uh, payload. So the, the useful bits from the layer above is NF minus N0. So these are the payload bits. And then we have an acknowledgement with NA bits here. Questions on that? So what is then the efficiency? Well, for stop and wait, and this is what we uh, looked at last time, we have a reaction time which is uh, two times the processing time and propagation time plus the time it takes for one frame plus the acknowledgement frame. So here's when the first bit leaves the, the transmitter of the data frame. Here's when the last bit leaves. Here's when the first bits arrive. Here's when the last bit arrives. There's some processing time. And then the acknowledgement goes back, the first bit of the acknowledgement and the last bit of the acknowledgement. A little bit of processing of this. And now we're ready to transmit the next packet. So this is the turnaround time or reaction time. So there's a propagation time, frame duration, processing time, 
acknowledgement time, acknowledgement frame time, propagation time, and some processing time. Uh, so if we then uh, look at error-free transmission, which is the best case, what is the effective rate of stop and wait? It's the number of uplay bits divided by the time it takes to transmit one frame, which is nf minus N Z no divided by t0. <coughs> and then if we calculate it, we get to this number. Okay. Um, uh, we will later on look at what happens when we have uh, uh, errors in this also, but that we will do that the next lecture. We won't do that today, so never mind that. Okay. Um, actually, uh, I was planning to talk a little bit about selective repeat today, but let's let's postpone that also because we're running out of time. So the next time we 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 meet each other, we will talk about how to calculate the effective rate when we have errors for stop and wait for go back in, and also for selective repeat. So selective repeat we haven't talked about yet, so I will present that also uh, on Monday when we meet each other. All right, so have a good weekend. And don't forget to choose your uh, application for the third part of the project. I think that's uh, due today. Right? OK? Alltså jag har det på en bit.